I'm trying to survive one of the most tragic stories in Australia's history. Oh, he's almost got me wrist. Good sign that there's a freshwater spring or a source of fresh water. It'd just about kill me, I reckon. We have got to keep our, our eyes and ears peeled. There is a serious giant crab in here somewhere. There's a decent sized hole here. <sighs> this is the most tragic tale of attempted survival I've ever heard. And it starts right here. Although it ends a number of miles down this way on another island with a young mother and her newborn baby dead in a metal container that they used to escape an attack from the local Aboriginals on this island and they drifted north. The tragic images of this combined with the diary that she kept through the entire ordeal shocked the nation. This is the story of Mary Watson. But like all good stories, there is two sides to it. So as this episode goes on, I'm gonna share them both with you. Here it is just up here actually. So the year is 1881. Mr. Watson, looking to expand his fishing business, comes out to the island here and builds a bit of a house, sets up a bit of a farm, and brings out his young wife, Mary, and two Chinese slaves to work with him. And this is the remains of his setup you can still see behind me here. But what Mr. Watson hadn't appreciated at the time was that the area he chose to build was actually a really sacred site for the Aboriginal people at the time. And for tens of thousands of years, they'd been coming out here to hunt. I mean, the crystal clear waters out the front, the mangrove system here, and all the land provided them with an abundant food source, which made the trip over from the mainland that they did every season, it made it worthwhile. Look at this behind me. There's still remnants of some of the, the bush tucker that the Aboriginal people would have eaten back in the day here. Let's see what else we can find. Oh, check this out. What an amazing little cave system here. Overlooking that little creek down there where as the tide comes in, all the fish will come in there. And no doubt this would have been a, a pretty special spot for the Aboriginal people. And a lot of caves like this were found elsewhere in the country. And they've got the, the Aboriginal rock art all over the ceilings. Whereas here, I did wonder whether this was some faded rock art. But what an amazing view from in here, eh? Even just sitting here, the bush tucker here is plentiful over my shoulder. This guy's are uh, what we call a bush passion fruit growing all through this cave here so you wouldn't have to look too far for a feed here <laughs> you can hear them pop there it's like little lollies mm. beautiful sweet passion fruit seeds yum yum now back to 1881 so mr watson was out on the outer reef doing some fishing and just coincidentally the aboriginal people of the area they came out to start their seasonal stay out here they were pretty shocked to find some people set up in their sacred area. Basically a fight broke out. One of the Chinese servants was killed. The other Chinese servant was speared and he made it down to where Mary Watson was in the house. She had a gun, she shot the gun, which then spooked the Aboriginal people for the meantime. They felt they had no other means of escape apart from jumping in uh, this big metal tank or small metal tank. This is the tank they used to boil their sea cucumbers. They jumped in there, Mary Watson, the baby, and one of the Chinese slaves who was severely injured. He managed to get his hands on a couple of the Aboriginal spears on the way out. I, I believe they were still sticking out of him. And they, they were adrift. They set off from Lizard Island. And this is the last time that any of them were ever seen again alive. This is where they jumped in their tank and fled for their lives. Thankfully, due to the diary she kept, we can follow in her wake. We're in a little bit of a different vessel than what those guys were, but let's see where they ended up. So after a couple of days of drifting at sea, I reckon this is where she first washed in on. This behind me here is the sand island she wrote about in her diary that she was aiming for, but she ended up on that sandbank there, which is just out of the water with the current tide. From there, they would have come ashore and that's where we're gonna pick up our survival challenge, guys. So we know that the guys had a couple of crucial items with them and I'm gonna be using some similar items for this survival challenge. So first of all, they had a hand spear. Ah, Sam, the Chinese servant, poor bugger, he had spears hanging out of him everywhere. He'd been speared seven times up until this point. Secondly, I know they had a knife. And the third item is a flint. These are the items I'll be restricted to over the next few days. All right, let's get to it. First things first, have a walk around the island, see what we can find. Their whole chance of survival really depends on their ability to find water or hydration. 
So that's going to be the first and foremost thing we're going to go looking for, guys. Let's see what we can find. Any coconuts or any freshwater springs. We'll take anything at the moment. Now, this here is definitely a turtle nest. So we're likely a, a green turtle has come up from the ocean and dug a hole there to bury her eggs. So there could be up to 100 turtle eggs there just beneath the sand. The Aboriginal people back in the day would actually dig up these nests and eat the turtle eggs for a source of protein, but also a crucial source of hydration. These days, the, the turtles and their nests are all protected, so I can't go digging around here, but that could have been an option for them. But that's all I've found, really, so far. Let's keep looking. All the plants and everything here is incredibly dry and it just kind of paints the picture of what a, a bleak and, and crazy situation they're in. The quest for water and hydration is going to be quite tricky. There is a couple of rock pools sort of down there and if it's rained recently in the last week or so, they might still be holding a bit of fresh water. It's all salt down this far. You don't want to be drinking salt water. It's just all so dry and desolate on this island so far, but I have found a plastic bottle of water. Back in 1881, they wouldn't have had this luck. There was no plastic around, but I'm gonna try and make the most of my good fortune here and have a bit of a go on this. Oh, that hasn't been sealed. That's all, all salt water, unfortunately. Wouldn't have helped Mary Watson, and unfortunately it doesn't help us. Let's keep pressing on. So there's no signs of any little creeks or natural springs. I think this is just nothing more than basically a sand cave, a barren sand island with a tiny bit of vegetation on top. So even the trees are losing their leaves here. It's just a pretty dry and barren old island, really. There's like a couple of drops of rain coming down, but oh, there's, there's nothing in it. It's literally just out of that. It's not enough to even like wet yourself, but no doubt the guys would have been praying for rain. But other than that, it's just blue skies. Pretty barren on the beach there, but let's head inland and see if there's any bush tucker or uh, any hydration at all. There might be something here, guys. This here is a beach bean, and if I was to go ahead and eat it like that, it'd just about kill me, I reckon. But if I was to roast it or boil it and put it through quite a process, then it'd be edible. I do wonder how many good men had to play the guinea pig and go through that process until the, the word got around. But their little pinkish purple flowers, they're all right. A fair bit of flavor to them, like a snow pea. Now actually this is a, a native Aussie tree here and the fruits on it are a little bit of a thirst quencher. It looks like the birds have been into most of the ripe ones but we'll see if they've left any for us. This is the fruit here. Yeah, there's, the birds have been into them. This is the unripe green one but we're looking for the this color. They've left one tiny one for me. The birds haven't left me with much here. This is the size that they can get to. So this is the best we've got. So there's an orange type of flesh inside and a whole heap of seeds. Similar to a guava. I'll definitely get a little bit out of that. It's almost thirst quenching. You just want to suck and suck and suck until the pulp, you've got all the pulp and then spit the seeds out. But I mean, a couple of these underwhelming fruits, this isn't good enough to, enough to sustain us here. Now, something quite bizarre has just happened. A flock of pelicans has just flown over my head and all gone and perched up down on this side of the island here. Now, it's pretty rare to see pelicans out on the, the reef where we are here. So I'm going to sort of sneak on down and see what they're up to, whether they're aggregating for a certain reason. Maybe they found a water source. Maybe they see something which I didn't see, but let's go have a look. There's two other eagles in this tree here, and I bet they are the kids of that larger eagle we've seen in the bigger tree. It's almost like they've been kicked out of the main house and they're just down the road in like in the cubby house. Let's go see what these pelicans are doing. So the good news is we found the pelicans, but the bad news is they weren't at some secret watering hole that we'd missed. Pelicans are actually incredibly shy out in the wild, like away from the main harbors and stuff where they're used to people. And they sort of got one side at me and just went nut nah, and then took off. That's pretty cool. I, I haven't seen them like that out on the reef in this area.
So from her diary, we know Mary Watson and the crew struggled also to find any water or, or, or anything of great value on this island. But they stayed here tonight for the night and they hang around the entire next day tomorrow. And they were hoping for a passing ship to signal down, but there's nothing on the horizon. But check this out. There is a trigger fish that's up under the trees here. These guys have got, got some of the nastiest teeth, hey? Look at the fangs on him. He's all dried out and pretty rotten, so nothing for me to eat here. What a crazy, crazy fish. They get called a leather jacket in some areas because, yeah, you can make a, a leather handbag out of that. That's really leather at the moment. Now, this is the island with the three small mountains on it that Miss Watson described in her diary. By this stage, the crew has finished their small rations of water. They're getting pretty desperate. And this is the biggest island and, and the most promising yet for a water source. But as they pull in around in the next bay over, they spot some quote natives, the local Aboriginal people, and they're pretty scared from the previous experience. But the presence of the Aboriginal people here, it probably means that there is a water source and that they've got water, but they didn't want to get too close. So our Sam still pretty sore after his seven spear wounds in him. He goes out and looks for water around this way. Let's retrace his steps, see what we see. Depending on when the last rain was and how high the tide gets, these can hold fresh water. No such luck today. Let's keep looking. It is all pretty dry and desolate. No real sign of water up here. A bit of bush tucker here. This is called a Wongai plum. The so Sam might have found himself a bit of bush tucker. But still, at this point in time, water is the key factor. Now, I do wonder what the outcome would have been if they had approached those, uh, those Aboriginal people there. Because there's some amazing stories where shipwreck survivors have washed in and the Aboriginal people of Australia have actually taken them in and nurtured them, fed them and watered them. And some have actually lived on with those uh, Ab Aboriginal tribes for, for years later. There's one particularly interesting story of this a bit further north up the coast. And I'm gonna do an entire episode on that for a survival challenge later in this series. There's a little patch here with a bit of greenery behind me. Surely that's the best spot to dig if there's any fresh water springs underneath. The rest of it's all just looking like this. Surely in amongst this is our best chance. Oh, you know what? I think I might've found something. See how the ground is all this level and there is a big divot here. So the rest of the ground is all at this level here. But then here, I'm in this big divot and the, the ground seems a little bit moister. I'm just gonna go, go all out and have a dig here. Yeah, there's no signs of water yet. Lots of big geckos in here. There's more life and everything's green. So I'm unsure whether this is a freshwater spring coming up or whether it's just a depression on the island. So when it does rain, all the rain kind of gathers in here, which allows um, trees and plants to like, to live. There's no sign of any freshwater spring there, unfortunately. Oh, bummer. Really thought I was onto something then. With once again, no sign of water, it must have crossed their mind to approach the Aboriginal people down on the beach and just try their luck. But coming off that last experience, they must have been so terrified. They decided it was a safer option or the only option to jump back in their little vessel and set out and just fully be at the mercy of mother nature and just hoping a miracle happens, hoping the next stop they get washed in has got a freshwater spring or something. So that's what we're gonna do guys, back in the vessel. Let's see where we end up. So now getting very desperate for both water and food, the guy's washed on in here. I'm gonna circumnavigate the island, put a GoPro head mount on and see what we can find. In her diary, Watson wrote about not being able to find any water, but she did eat some clams here. So uh, let's see if I have any luck. Looks like they weren't the only ones that washed in here. This looks like the remains of a very old shipwreck. There's plenty of these clams around. These are now protected in um, today's day and age. These ones grow into the giant clam. They go quite impressive. So we can't eat these ones now. It's a uh, horrible, horrible ground to walk on here. It's all broken coral and these really sharp oysters on the rocks here. 
Now this is a good sign. It's transitioned into mangroves here. Now mangroves rely on a little bit of fresh water. So it's generally a good sign that there's a freshwater spring or a source of fresh water. So let's follow these. The crunched up turtle shell, which is a telltale sign that there's a crocodile here munching them up. So we have got to keep our, our eyes and ears peeled. Oh, check this out. It's like an inland, either a lake or a, or a river type system. Now we just got to try to determine if there's anywhere in this is fresh, whether it's all salt. As salty as it comes right here. But let's see where this starts. Let's see the top of this. It might be a freshwater spring. Everywhere is just so dry. A couple of green trees here. Almost like it's a riverbank. Well, there's water down here, but that is just swampy water and there's no chance we can drink that. This is the area that scare me. There could be a crocodile just under that surface there. No, we've got to find somewhere else. Fish in here? Oh, some smaller fish there. I'd really like to get out in that system, but this all looks like quick mud, basically. I'd sink straight in that, and there's too much chance of a crocodile in here. Uh, that's too dangerous. I'm going to have to keep looking. Just spotted some type of a monument or a grave or something up here. I had no idea this was here. I'm going to come and see what it's all about. There's a couple of graves, but I'm not sure who these belong to. Oh, maybe this is what we're looking for. I'm just going to let this settle and see if this is salt or fresh. But it's kind of almost like what a spring would be or a fresh water source. Oh man, it must be a little bit of fresh in that because for a second I was like, oh yeah, but then an overpowering taste of salt come through. Oh bugger, we're gonna have to keep looking. All right, just at the back of these mangroves here, I've stumbled across a couple of mud crab holes. So I'm gonna go in there and see if I can find any big mud crabs. That'd be like, what a morale boost and a great source of food. So the good news is I've made it right up to the top of that mangrove system. And this is where it starts. And this is where I was hoping there'd be a freshwater spring that comes out and allows the rest of the mangroves to grow, but man, it's just mud and nothing I want to be drinking down here at the moment, unfortunately. There's one, it's a there little one. He's too small. We want his granddad. That's a good sign though, good sign. It's super, super boggy, pretty thick through here. Perfect. Oh, it stinks in here. Oh, should have just freaking speared him, Jack. Look, it was a monster. Bummer, he's got away. So I spot him, he's sitting out in the open here. He must have been eating these mangrove snails. But then as I got closer and tried to try to pry him out, one of those big claws came over. I was like, oh no, this is a big one. But he's gone down deep in that hole now. And that hole goes down and it must take like a dog leg turn because I, I can't even tap around and feel him. So we're gonna have to continue looking elsewhere. Bummer. Oh. Probably wouldn't be the smartest thing that Miss Watson would be doing, but man, I need some food and I love big mud crabs. Now the mud crabs can just be so well camouflaged, but I'm looking to see if I can find any obvious holes where they'd be in, or whether they think they're just camouflaged under one of these tree roots or something. Holy moly! <laughs> Bloody hell, I almost stood on this big guy. There's a massive mud crab. I can't really get a good hold on him here. Oh, man. Oh, he's almost got me wrist. Jeez, this guy's been doing his yoga. He's so flexible. I'm in a tricky situation here. Oh man, I'm not in control at all. Come on, mate, let go. Jeez, he smashed that tree. I'm glad that's not my wrist. Yes, we've got one. Holy moly, yes. 
Look at the size of that, guys, in that tiny little pothole. That is gonna be one hell of a morale booster. There he is, guys. A giant, giant mud crab. I reckon he is one of the most ferocious I've ever had to pull out. He was just ready to rumble. They've got the second highest level of testosterone in the animal kingdom, and he had all of it on show there. These big claws were ready to crush anything that he could get his hands on. Now, I don't know if this would have been the best idea for Miss Watson, spending precious like energy and hydration looking around the mangroves, but there was two purposes here. I needed food, and also I was following these mangroves up to try and find fresh water. One thing for sure, I didn't find any fresh drinking water, but at least we're eating. Now this is a trick that the Aboriginal people used to use to keep the, the sand flies and mosquitoes off. All right, let's carry on. Come on, keen to get out of here now. I've had just about enough time in these mangroves. There's another little inlet here actually that comes from the ocean. Let's try to follow this one up a little bit. It's cool, a bait fish. These are all hardy head. Look at them, nothing bigger chasing on that. Oh, what's this? You guys having a bit of a feed? What have you got there, mate? You just got his head underground. Leave your bee, mate. Oh, check this out. Very dirty, but a shell. What a beauty. Home. Holy moly. Look at what I've just found, the size of this crab. That is freaking giant. The one I got was big, but check this out. <laughs> there is a serious giant crab in here somewhere. There's a decent sized hole here. I think this is definitely worth just poking my head in. This might be the biggest crab I've, I've seen. goes so deep, way too deep. There's no chance of getting him in that hole anyway. Ah, wasps, ah, wasps, ah, ah, ah. Oh, sorry guys, I've had a sec to chill out now. Here's Miss Watson, wasn't the only one to, to be washed in here under pretty poor circumstances. I don't know the story here, but I hope whoever was on board is all right. Keep moving, keep looking for water. This is not quite the tropical paradise island that you associate with the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. It looks like what I imagine sort of the, the dark side of Mars looks like. It's just dry and sharp and spiky and almost looks inhospitable. Look at this. No way. Is that a message in there? Looks like there was a message in there that has become waterlogged, bugger. Looks like a message in a bottle, doesn't it? So we're now down the full lap of the island and no water, no hydration. We do have a giant mud crab, so we're gonna cook that up. The wind is quite strong, so I've chosen this spot here and the stones all around it will allow the heat to sort of stay trapped in and cook that crab quickly. And this is actually where they had, which would become their final meal. They cooked up some clams. We're not allowed to take clams, so we're gonna cook up a mud crab. Here we go. I'm sure having a fire and a bit of fresh food would have boosted morale because it gave them enough energy and strength to keep going. The story doesn't end here, guys. Some serious heat coming out of there now. I'm gonna break the fire up a little bit and then time to get this crab on. Check out the size of this absolute beauty, hey? He's got like a bit of an oven there for him now. Oh yeah, beautiful bright orange color, which lets us know he's ready to go. All right, I'm gonna give him a dip to help him cool off there, and then it's food time. Now, what do you reckon you'd be paying for this at a fancy restaurant? Unbelievable, hey? All right, let's see how we went. Let's get straight into the best bit, big giant claw. Oh, nice. That's a good crack, really. That's all beautiful meat in there. Mm, amazing. There's something about catching your own meal and cooking it up like that. It just feels so damn good. I hope the guys got some sort of peace or some sort of enjoyment out of this moment here. Well, they must have because it gave them the motivation to keep going. That, along with the boat that they'd seen pass heading north 
earlier in the day. It meant that they, were, they weren't quite done yet. So they jumped back in their little vessel and continued on. And that's what we're gonna do, guys. We're gonna jump back in our vessel and follow in the wake. Oh, there's a drink in how juicy these guys are. So they pulled their tank ashore and came up for the trees to set up what they called a camp somewhere like this under the trees here. And now they've found themselves in this crazy predicament where they're surrounded by so much water, but none of it which they can drink. I'm going to try a bit of a technique to see if we can drink any of this ocean water around us. Let's see how we go. So from her diary, there's two other items which gave me a bit of an idea that she spoke about. One being a pot which she boiled the pot of rice in uh, and then the baby's blanket. So this has given me a bit of an idea. I'm just gonna see if we can combine these things and get some drinking water as one last effort. Let's get this fire cranking for a little bit and then on to the next step. Well, we'll put that pot of seawater straight on top. Notice on the lid there's no water droplets at the moment. It's all nice and dry. Let's give this a couple of minutes. All right, there we go. So this water on here is fresh drinking water. It's obviously gonna be very hot. That salt water's starting to bubble and do exactly as we hoped. So the liquid water after being heated up is turning into a gas, coming up, hitting the lid there. It then turns back into a liquid. This time, beautiful fresh water. Let's see if we've got enough to get a mouthful of water. Yeah, see that's, this is all drinking water. Oh, now we're, now we're going. So this process here is called thermal distilling. Distilling means basically turning salt water into fresh water. Thermal means with heat, which is what we're doing. And we've got a tiny, tiny bit drinking water there. I'm gonna try and get this in with the wind. There you go, man, beautiful drinking water. Pretty tedious task, but when you've got all the time in the world and the ocean, with no shortage of water, this is one technique that can work. I've got a bit of an idea for this baby's blanket here. I'm gonna see if we can use this to catch the fresh water as it comes up. Now to further improve this, rather than the water hitting the lid, and if you don't capture it quick enough, it'll just drip back into your pot. We've used the baby's blanket, but you could use anything that is absorbent. The idea here, you can just leave this. That'll um, continue to boil, continue to condense, and will actually gather in this blanket or tea towel in this case. If I don't light the damn thing on fire, I'm gonna have to turn the heat down a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, Fran, I lit our tea towel on fire. All right, now I'm just gonna let this boil away, see how much we get. All right, let's see if we've had any luck. Oh yeah, look at all that steam coming out. There's a fair bit of weight there, it's, it's warm. Yeah, look at that, water's coming out. Oh yeah, look at that. That's fresh water, slow and steady, but that's turning into fresh water. Imagine then you could, yeah, you can definitely just suck fresh water straight out of that. Let's keep going with that. Oh man, what a great taste that is. Fresh water, fresh from the ocean. These look like the rain clouds that they would have been praying for, hoping for a bit of rain out of this. Oh, what a tease. We've got almost a rain cloud. It's dark, there's like a couple of tiny drops off it, but oh, not enough to wet your whistle. No boats, no water, nearly dead with thirst. These are the last words written. What a horrible way to go. Their remains were found a number of months later. Ah, Sam, the Chinese servant, seemed he used the last of his energy to go around the corner and die out of sight. In the tank here, Mary Watson's remains were found. In one hand, she had her young baby, only three months old. In the other hand, she had her diary. The horrible irony of this all is that the tank they were in was now half full of water. It seemed the rains that they were praying and wishing for did come. 
but they were just a little bit too late. So Mary Watson goes on to become an Australian hero, applauded for her bravery. This island gets named after her. The bay where this incident first started gets named after her. There's monuments named after her. She's got a statue. There's streets named after her. There's museums with sections dedicated to her. Her name lives on. But unfortunately, there is another side of this story which doesn't really get told too much in the history books. You've got to do a bit of digging. Now, let's rewind just a little bit. So when Mr. Watson returned from his fishing trip, Holy he man. saw his house in ruins, up in flames, and Mary was gone. He feared she'd been kidnapped or murdered, got in touch with the local police officer. This police officer then ordered the massacre of indigenous people, I quote, to teach the blacks a lesson. Unfortunately, this was very successful, indiscriminately killing 150 people, uh, none of whom were linked to this incident at all. Killing women, children, men of all ages. And unfortunately, these weren't one off. This is just one tale in a very, very dark part of Australia's history. So in total, the guys had been adrift for 12 days, drifting over 40 miles, completely at the mercy of the ocean. And this is where their story tragically ends. But they were going in the right direction. If they managed to summon the strength to jump in for one more drift, I got a feeling we might have had a happy ending after all. Let's go check out where they would have ended up. Now, one more drift would have had them come straight past this headland here. They would have been looking up at the big black dry rocks and no doubt they would have spotted this one little patch of greenery in amongst the dry rocks, one patch of life. This is a hint that there's a fresh water source nearby. Now in more recent times, sailors and yachties have actually painted on the rocks to make it a little bit more obvious for anyone in the exact predicament that Mary Watson was in. Now I'd actually heard about this place passed down from some old salty seamen and yachties, but never been here. Let's go straight in the cave and um, follow the signs and see if we can find any water. Oh, here's one really good sign. The only other footprints in here are animals. So these are a wallaby footprints and they will lead you straight to fresh drinking water. You can see he knows his way around. He's hopped in here and there's a little marsupial. This looks like the little thieving marsupial which stole Fran's bikini one time. They look like they go down there. So these wallaby tracks lead in here. I'm gonna have a dig in there. That looks promising. I'll have a bit more of a look around before I dig. Maybe up further. Signs have sort of run out, but we'll see if there's anything. <gasps> I think I've found something, eh? I think that's water and I don't even need to dig for it here. Oh, you absolute beauty. So this is all water, as you can see. What a crazy cave system, man. The temperature in here is like 10 degrees cooler than outside this place is an actual oasis. The moment of truth now, I'm gonna drink this and see if we've found what we're looking for. Could this have been the fresh water that, that could have saved them? You beauty, this is it. This is the fresh water. Oh, amazing. Coming straight out of the sand. It'd be filtered as it comes up through the sand, running out onto the beach. What an absolute gem. We found some fresh water. Yeah. Mmm, this is fresh as well. The guys were agonizingly close to pulling off one of the best survival getaways in history. While this episode is certainly in memory of Mary Watson and our Sam and the little baby, it's also in memory of those 150 Aboriginal people that lost their lives these days that don't have islands named after them. They don't have monuments named after them. It all just got swept under the rug. I really do hope you enjoyed this one, guys. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and I'll see you on the next one.